All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. This is a channel for educational purposes, and uh, today is our 465th video on Dewey B. Larson and his reciprocal system of theory. The reciprocal system of theory is a theory of everything or a generalized theory that um, was proposed first by Mr. Larson back in 1959 with his two fundamental postulates. And from there he deduced a theoretical universe, what the universe would look like if his postulates were correct. And uh, he wrote some books comparing his theoretical universe with the measured empirical universe of the legacy scientists. And we're looking at one of those books today called Basic Properties of Matter. This has to do with chemistry. And we are in the middle of chapter 7 that is called uh, Temperature Relations. Now, Mr. Larson's reciprocal system is also known as a, the universe of motion. Larson was uh, not the first person to propose a universe made out of motion as opposed to matter or energy. But I think he was the first to um, get traction and get some, have some success with that approach. And one of the main reasons that he had success is that he was um, able to define motion uh, more specifically as the relationship between space and time. So the universe is made out of motion, and motion is the relationship between space and time. Uh, now you can uh, dispute that if you want. And, and this also leads to um, a reciprocal relationship between space and time. For Larson, motion was a fraction with space or time as the numerator, and time or space as the denominator. And so that is a reciprocal relationship. Now, the most basic example of uh, motion uh, that we know of is speed. The bicycle is moving 12 miles per hour, 12 miles of space and one hour of time. Uh, that is space over time, speed. And if we double the space, if we double the speed, we can now say uh, the bicycle is now moving 24 miles per hour. But we also could say, and it would be equivalent, that the bicycle is now moving 12 miles per half hour. You can multiply the space by 2, or you can divide the time by 2. That uh, evinces a, a reciprocal relationship. But Larson spreads that out not only just to speed, but all forms of motion. Uh, um, really, all scientific phenomena are kinds of motion. Mass is a kind of motion. Energy is a kind of motion. Pressure is a kind of motion. Surface tension is a kind of motion. Power is a kind of motion. Acceleration and force are kinds of motion. And they all have their time, space, Signatures, for example, force is time over space to the second power. Uh, matter is time to the third power over space to the third power, and so on. So uh, that's really where Larson starts. Now, when he is referring to motion, he is referring to a, a more generalized kind of motion that he calls scalar motion. Scalar motion has been, um, you know, uh, noticed and acknowledged by scientists, but they have not uh, recognized its importance. Um, Larson puts it at the center of the story. But a scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude 
but it has no specific direction. You can envision a scalar motion using a balloon that you put dots on. If you blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other. Every dot is moving away from every other dot. And in fact, every location on that balloon is moving away from every other location on the balloon. Uh, so every dot is moving in every direction, no specific direction. And this is a scalar motion, the motion of that outward balloon, Larson refers to as the progression. And the inward motion, if you were to contract the balloon, would be analogous to gravitation. Um, now, really, his progression, that outward motion of the balloon, is really like the source of the reciprocal system. This is the motion that the universe is built upon. And uh, you have to... If you are going to have a universe of motion, you have to be able to um, buy into the concept of motion without anything moving. Motion precedes anything that would be moving. And motion, in fact, comprises anything that would be moving. And so this motion is... Um, moving outward and kind of the, uh, it is eternal and omnipresent. It occurs in all spaces and all locations at all times. And then, so you could think of it kind of like as a zero point. And then uh, by harnessing that motion, we build up, you know, particles, matter, aggregates of matter and so on and that's really done by reversing that flow of the progression that outward flow and turning it into the inward flow which is gravitation and gravitation is really the essence of atoms and and matter the gravitation is inherent to the matter it doesn't have anything to do with attraction to other matter. Every, uh, it's just like being on the surface of a contracting balloon. All of the dots are moving toward each other, but they're, they're not being pulled by any, um, any of the other dots. They are all pursuing their own course, but they all happen to be moving toward each other. So that's kind of, uh, the framework. Now let's, um, just go over Larson's two fundamental postulates, and then we can get into some of this reading. So the uh, Larson's first fundamental postulate is that the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And the second postulate is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics, its primary magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. That second postulate is basically what he uses to take that first postulate and to create his theoretical universe from it. So you take the first postulate, and then you uh, go through a process of if this, then that, if this, then that. But the, the, what is between the this and the that is mathematical probability, geometrical considerations, and logic. So um, those are his postulates. We've got a three-dimensional universe, space, time, and motion all come in three dimensions. Space, time, and motion all come in discrete units. Um, and the progression, that outward movement that is the source of everything, is at the rate of one unit of space per one unit of time. Larson calls that unit speed. It's also known as the speed of light. And that progression at the speed of light in all directions from all locations at all times, uh, Larson refers to it as the progression of the natural reference system. So 
we have a spatial reference system that's stationary and a temporal reference system that's stationary. These both, uh, you know, the spatial reference system that's stationary is three dimensions of space. X, Y, Z coordinates. Larson calls that coordinate space. And it's accompanied by clock time. The clock is progressing still in a scalar manner. So in a gravitationally bound system, you have this stationary reference system. And in a uh, re kind of a reciprocal gravitational environment, you have this uh, temporal reference frame by extrapolation from the reciprocal postulate, space and time being reciprocals. That means that space and time have the same qualities. So time also has three dimensions in a still frame and space is progressing. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart in this temporal, stationary temporal reference system. So you have these two stationary reference systems, one of three dimensional space, one of three dimensional time, but each one is only going to be able to occupy one dimension of motion. So there, there are three dimensions of motion. So uh, the three dimensions of motion cannot be um, properly represented in a, a stationary reference system. But Larson has this natural reference system from which he makes his uh, assessments and his measurements. So he's using the natural reference system and really saying that the scientists are getting it all wrong or at least partially wrong because they're using the wrong reference system. They're using the stationary reference system, which is only applicable to certain environments of the universe. Um, okay, and um, so what this really sets up is several different sectors of the universe. You have this uh, outward motion at the speed of light in all directions from all times and places. And that is this midpoint of the universe. On one side, you have the uh, what Larson calls the cosmic sector. That is uh, faster than the speed of light motion. And you have the material sector, which is slower than the speed of light motion. And then within the material sector, you have what he calls the time region. This is an inside region within the material sector where space is less than one unit. Again, you have the discrete unit postulate. Everything has to be at least one unit. And so uh, if space is not one full unit, uh, we're talking about microscopic type of situations, then there is no motion in space because you can't get less than one unit. So you have only motion in time. But an outward motion in time is equivalent to an inward motion in space. So if two particles are approaching each other to uh, one unit of space, they get, to be, they get to be one unit apart, but then they can't approach each other any closer in space. So what they do is they move outward in time. And outward in time is the equivalent of inward in space. We see it as inward in space, but it is really happening in time. But we don't see time, we only see space in a spatial reference system. The same thing is happening uh, in uh, reciprocal form in the cosmic sector. Within the cosmic sector, uh, within one unit of time, um, two cosmic particles or atoms cannot approach each other any closer than one unit of time, so they move apart in space, which is the equivalent of moving inward in time. And um, atoms and particles, atoms and aggregates of atoms uh, basically come from reversing that outward motion of the progression to an inward motion like a gravitation. And it has to be done through first reversing the progression and then rotating it backwards in three dimensions. And that is um, 
a fairly detailed process, but that's the short version. The reversal is called the photon. And then if you reverse, and then you rotate the photon, then you end up having a sub at subatomic particle. And then when you combine two subatomic particles, then you can get up to an atom. And an atom is denoted by Larson with a three number um, series, A, B, and C. A is the first two-dimensional rotation. B is the second two-dimensional rotation that alternates with the first. And C is a, an optional one-dimensional rotation in the opposite direction of the first two. And that is, um, can be positive, negative, or zero. It is zero in the uh, noble gases. And um, so, for example, um, oxygen. Oxygen is denoted by Larson as 2, 2, negative 2. Two-dimensional uh, two primary rotations, two secondary two-dimensional rotations, and two negative um, one-dimensional rotations. So that is its, you know, signature in Larson's system. And Larson takes those numbers, and from them, he um, f uh, deduces uh, various, these basic properties of matter, kind of, uh, uh, and those come, uh, he starts with compression and heat. Compression uh, when you move into the time region or the space region, the rules reverse, just like they do when you cross that unit speed boundary. When you cross the unit space or unit time boundaries, you also have to rever uh, reverse the rules. And so now the progression is moving inward in equivalent space and gravitation is moving outward. Whereas in the, you know, uh, the normal progression is moving outward and gravitation is moving inward. And by that, those reversal of directions, you are able to establish an interatomic equilibrium at the point where the gravitation is equal to the progression. The progression is constant and, you know, omnipresent and eternal, whereas gravitation is uh, variable. But there is a certain point where they are equal, and that is uh, what Larson calls the interatomic distance between atoms. And at that interatomic equilibrium, then there can be internal pressure, which is from the progression that is uh, called compression, or an internal or a, uh, a rotational um, motion, outward motion, that he refers to as heat. And so those two uh, those are two factors that come into play that atoms deal with. And so he deduces kind of the various relations from that. We'll start here on, uh, in chapter 7. Uh, he was just talking about potassium in particular. Uh, he was talking about its specific heat curve. And the specific heat is the amount of heat that you have to add to something to raise it by a certain temperature. Um, so it's kind of like the efficiency of heat uh, transfer. And um, this is based on the rotational uh, levels that Larson assigns to these atoms, which is based on their periodic table numbers, ABC numbers. And he says that in potassium, the thermal factors are 2, 1, 1. And it maintains the same factors throughout the entire solid range. As indicated in Chapter 5, the endpoint temperature of this type of curve is 9.32 times the temperature of the first transition point. Now, it's important to note that one of the findings of the reciprocal system is that temperature is, a, uh, is quantized, just like everything else. All the units are quantized, um, and that um, the temperature belongs to the atom or molecule. It is not a uh, something of, of, of an aggregate of atoms. Each atom has its own temperature. And the aggregate temperature is just kind of like the average of all of the molecules. But each one has its own temperature, and they follow specific curves. 
um, and um, make their various transitions uh, where they are trying to avoid getting to the melting point because uh, there, uh, anything that's three dimensions in the solid state is in the solid, is in, um, well, three dimensions in the solids, three dimensions in the time region is the solid state. When it emerges from one dimension of the time region into the, uh, what he calls the time space region, which is the rest of the material sector, then it becomes a liquid. But because uh, probability relations, solids are more probable than liquids. So a solid is going to do whatever it can to avoid having to change into a liquid. And so it makes these transitions, which makes it harder for the heat to uh, change the, uh, to move it closer to the, um, to the melting point boundary. So you can put in, uh, when it makes its first transition, it basically increases its slope by a factor of eight. So it makes it eight, that you have to add eight times more heat to make it uh, uh, move any closer to the melting point line. Okay, so, and he evaluated these different uh, curves depending on how many transitions are made and for this potassium kind of curve which I think is uh, uh, makes three transitions um, 9.32 times the temperature of the first transition point so that's kind of the first transition point is somewhat of a reference point um, and then the other transition points are including the melting point are um, factors of that first transition point. So in, uh, in the potassium type of curve, uh, the temperature is 9.32 times what the temperature of the first transition point is. And he says this leads to an endpoint temperature of 336 degrees. The measured melting point is 337 degrees. That's Kelvin. Uh, at absolute temperature scale. So the measured melting point is 337 degrees Kelvin. And uh, the difference there is because when something leaves the uh, solid state, that is not uh, actually the or origin of the liquid state. Because again, temperature is quantized. So once you get to be a liquid, you have to you have to also get to the next quantum level of the original, the initial quantum level of a liquid. So the end of the solid state isn't going to get you to the first level of the liquid. So the end of the solid state in this case is 336 degrees, but the beginning of the liquid state is 337 degrees. The measured melting point is 337 degrees. In this case, then, the solid endpoint and the melting point happen to coincide within the limits of the accuracy of the investigation. Chlorine, an element only two steps lower on the atomic series than potassium, but a member of the next lower group, um, and, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, what are those called? Um, uh, hal halogens. Uh, has the lower type of specific heat curve with n equals 2 only as opposed to 3. So the endpoint temperature of this curve is 4.56 on the relative scale where the first transition point is 1. The thermal factors that determine the transition point and are applicable to the first segment of the curve are 4, 2, 1. But if these factors are applied to the endpoint, they lead to an impossibly high temperature. It is thus apparent that the factors applicable to the second segment of the curve are lower than those applicable to the first segment. In line with the previously noted tendency toward a decrease in the thermal factors with increasing temperature. Uh, the indicated factors applicable to the endpoint in this case are the same 2-1-1 combination that we found in potassium. 
they correspond to an endpoint temperature of 164 degrees Kelvin, just below the melting point at 170, as the theory requires. Next, we look at two curves of the n equals 4 type the endpoint of which is at a relative temperature of 17.87 times that of the tra first transition point. On the basis of the thermal factors 4, 6, 1, the absolute temperature of the endpoint is 1,765 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is, uh, what atom is he looking at here? Uh, he doesn't even say yet. Okay, he's looking at two two different atoms with curves of the n equals 4 type. Okay, the uh, absolute temperature of the endpoint is 1765 degrees Kelvin, which is consistent with the melting points of both cobalt at 1768 and iron at 1808. Or 18, yeah, 1808. Um, here too, the indicated factors at the endpoint are lower than those applicable to the first segment of the specific heat curve. But in this case, there is independent evidence of the decrease. Cobalt, which has the factors 482 in the first segment, is already down to 461 at the second transition point, while iron, uh, the initial factors of which are 4. Uh, 462 has reached, uh, I guess maybe, okay, 482 has reached 462 at this point with two more segments of the curve in which to make the additional reduction. Okay, now you can kind of see that Larson's kind of out in the weeds here talking about some very, you know, somewhat technical and, and arcane um, matters having to do with uh, specific elements in the periodic table. But just keep in mind that the reciprocal system is a generalized theory of everything. And so the same principles that are oper operative here when we're talking about chemistry are also relevant in whatever other subject that you want to plug it into. Um, so, you know, he is talking about things that maybe seem somewhat uh, irrelevant, if not, you know, insignificant, um, but they have full application. So we're really trying to kind of just think of analog analogies, you know, uh, how, how, how would this apply somewhere else? You, you know, what, uh, what does this have to do with and in order to be able to do that, you really have to kind of survey Larson's uh, oeuvre, so to speak, about his, his other books and see, well, let me look at what he says about astronomy. How does this plug into his astronomical theory? How does this plug into his metaphysics, uh, where he's talking about philosophy or psychology? Or how does this plug into his economic system? And once you kind of get a broad coverage of the reciprocal system, then you can start to see, um, you know, the commonalities between the theory in different areas. And so that's what I'm trying to do on this channel is to give you a broad coverage. We've gone through Larson's book, Nothing But Motion, on atomic physics. We've gone through Beyond Space and Time, which is on metaphysics, philosophy, religion, psychology. We've gone through, we're about to go through one of his books on economics called The Road to Permanent, Permanent Prosperity. Um, so we're trying to, to look at how Larson plugs in those fundamental postulates to every subject. But right now we're talking about chemistry and heat temperature relations. Okay, compounds of elements about group 1b or having a significant content of such elements follow one or the other of the type 1 patterns that have been illustrated by examples from the elements. The hydrocarbons and other compounds of the lower group elements have specific heat curves of type 2. 
uh, in which the endpoint is at a relative temperature of 1.80. As an example of this class, we can take ethylene. The thermal factors of these lower group compounds are limited to 111, 211, and the combination value 1.511. As we found in volume 1, however, the two groups of atoms which ethylene and similar compounds are composed are inside one time region unit of distance, um, which is a concept that is um, a little bit opaque to me and also um, way out in the weeds. But we'll just say that uh, you use the, what he calls the interregional ratio. Uh, that's how much is lost in the translation when you're looking across a sector or regional boundary. You can't see everything that's going on on the other side of the boundary, and you have to reduce your results by the interregional ratio. And uh, when you do that, um, you have to then reduce the um, measure of the time region. They therefore act jointly in thermal interchange rather than acting independently in the matter of two inorganic radicals, such as those in um, NH4NO3. Each group contrib uh, contributes to the thermal factors of the molecule, and the, values applic the value applicable to the molecule as a whole is the sum of the two components. Ethylene uses 111 and 1 in 1 half 1 1 combinations. A difference of this kind between the two halves of an organic molecule is quite common and no doubt reflects the lack of symmetry between the positive and negative components that was subject of comment in the discussion of organic structure. The combined factors amount to a total of 6.5 units. This corresponds to a transition point at 50. 8 degrees Kelvin, and which agrees with the empirical curve, and an endpoint at 104 degrees Kelvin coincident with the observed melting point. Okay, we're going to leave it there for today, and we'll uh, learn some more about temperature relations tomorrow, and, uh, you know, just hang in there with this. Uh, it moves slowly, but the payback is great because you uh, get to grasp a theory of everything that you can apply for the rest of your life to any subject. All right, thanks for tuning in today and have a 